Good afternoon. Welcome to Policy Exchange. My name is Dean Godson. A pleasure of being uh, chairman of this uh, important uh, panel event which we're hosting today. Building beautiful places has been a core part of our policy mission over recent years, starting with the work we did with uh, Create Smith, Create Streets uh, some years ago, then moving on, of course, to the work of uh, Sir Roger Scruton, Building Beautiful, and now, of course, with our most recently uh, sent out newsletter on uh, Place Matters. And uh, it's a particular pleasure to do it on this day, on th this important announcement by Secretary of State, by Nicholas Boy Smith, uh, Chair of the Transition Board of the Office for Place, and for Joanna Averley to welcome her here as uh, Chief Planning Officer for the Government. We're first going to show you a video uh, of uh, where government policy and government approach uh, is going, and then Secretary of State will take over, and then we'll, uh, Nicholas Boy Smith, and then we'll have a QA, uh, which uh, we urge everyone to stick your electronic hand up as soon as. Uh, possible usual uh, policy exchange house rules no question too outrageous you just have to state your name and organization first so look forward to hearing what all of you have to say and now over to the video thank you Building beautiful places has massively impacted on my family's lives, in particular my sister, who lived in one of the old properties and moved into one of the new beautiful flats. Um, she was housebound in a wheelchair, um, wasn't able to leave home due to access issues, um, moved into one of the new builds and is now freely able to live her life. So I was one of the last residents to actually move into the building. Um, but as soon as I saw the building, when I was shown it, I automatically knew that I wanted to live here. <laughs> Today I've been at the Bourne Estate in Camden. I've been meeting the residents to hear how they were involved in the process of designing the new homes that have been built here. And they are fantastic new homes. They're really beautifully designed to a very high quality and there's great public spaces around them. Tree-lined streets, playgrounds and community centres that have truly fostered and reinvigorated the very strong sense of community that was here beforehand. So thank you to everybody who's been involved in this project, to the council, to the community, the architects. This is a model of what we would like to create all over the country building back better, building beautiful places and homes. Everything about the way they've done this regeneration and what they've created is right. Um, first of all, the process they went through. So many estate regenerations pay lip service to community consultation, uh, but don't actually properly get into co-design. Right from the start of the process, residents here were involved in selecting architects, selecting the brief, and making sure that it was a beautiful new development that, that properly fitted in. And then secondly, what they've created is just marvellous. It's so lovely when you come back here and you feel the beauty of the place and it just makes your heart lift because you know you're here, you're amongst friends. As you say, building beautiful places is just, it's, it's so important to people's uh, mental health and their feeling of joyousness in life. Building beautiful places is about people getting together and becoming a community. The beauty comes not just from the aesthetics of the buildings, but the beauty of the community and the people that live here. And I, I think really it's that um, opportunity for meeting people, whether on an organised or a haphazard basis, <laughs> that could really come up with some wonderful things and um, it really makes it a you know, super place to be.
Well, a warm welcome to you all, and thank you very much, Dean, and to everybody at Pulse Exchange for hosting us today. And I hope you enjoyed watching that short video that sets out the ambitions that we want to talk about today. The launch of the Office for Place, alongside the new national model design code and the revised national planning policy framework, mark, I believe, a significant change in direction for housing and planning in this country. After the upheavals of the last 16 months, many people are rethinking what they want from their homes and their local communities. Those lucky enough to enjoy space, to work from home, gardens, or ready access to parks and public spaces will be making full use of them, not least on beautiful days like today. But for those who don't or can't, the need for us as a government and as a country to respond with more and better homes feels more urgent and important than ever before. The Prime Minister and I are proud to have overseen the most new homes delivered last year of any year in my lifetime. Almost a quarter of a million more families are able to enjoy the security and the pride that comes with owning a home of their own. But house prices are rising sharply, and the case for new housing is more important than ever. As we respond to the need for more houses to help the next generation of families, we must also create places in which people feel a genuine sense of belonging. People do not want their built environment to be a fragment of anywhere. It must be somewhere. That hasn't always been true of new housing, which often pays little heed to local identity or lacks the simple things such as tree-lined streets that foster the neighbourliness that we all seek in our daily lives. Poll after poll suggests that we prefer homes built before planning really began with the 1947 Planning Act, not those that came after it. And when I speak to planners and to architects, too often they live in homes built before 1947 themselves, not in those built afterwards. Despite the post-war mistakes, we do have some of the best designers, the best architects and the best planners in the world. And we do have one of the greatest built environments of any country on earth. Why else before the pandemic did legions of international tourists flock every year to our amazing market towns, our beautiful villages, our great cathedral cities to look up and admire what we and our forebears built. But we can do better than what we've done in recent decades. So we are putting beauty back at the heart of how we build. And I use the word back deliberately because a foundational principle behind the office for place and for what this government will do is that there is wisdom to be drawn from the creation of communities throughout the ages. Today, it means resetting our approach so that we're not just building houses, but creating beautiful, greener, enduringly popular places where people want to live and can prosper and which we will be proud to hand on to our children and grandchildren. An approach that has been spearheaded by the invaluable work of the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission, appointed by my predecessor, James Brokenshire, under your inspired leadership, Nicholas, and that of our late great friend and former colleague, Sir Roger Scruton. I want to thank once again everyone who was involved in that mission and to say to them that your work has not been wasted. Your work will lead a, syst a systemic change in the way that homes are built and places are created in this country. It's no exaggeration to say that your Living with Beauty report is, I believe, one of the most important that we've seen 
in recent years, most notably for the powerful case it makes for why places matter more than ever as beacons of pride, of identity and belonging, all the things that we care about and are more important to politics here and abroad than ever before in my lifetime. Places that stand the test of time in every sense, that are as good for the planet as they are for the soul, are what we want to create. That's why beautiful, high quality homes must be the norm, not the exception. The cost exacted by poor homes and places on quality of life, on mental health, on social mobility and opportunity for young people is well known and well evidenced. Less explored is how the decline in quality and yes of beauty that we've seen since the post-war period has corresponded with ever increasing opposition to new housing. The case for new housing is more important than ever but it is also more difficult to make than ever. So far from beauty and quality being a luxury, it's clear that they are key to unlocking community consent for development and housing. Beautiful high quality homes are approved quicker, sell faster, add to house prices and are enduringly popular. Let me give you a few examples. Coal Drops Yard in King's Cross is an excellent one. Of, this is an example of imaginative, visionary regeneration. A set of Victorian warehouses transformed. A 52-column steel structure threaded within the fabric of 19th century buildings. A new space for people to live, to shop, to come together, fusing local history with a global city on the move, on the up. And last week, I was in Beeston, in Nottinghamshire, to see a former coach depot being transformed into a square that would not be out of place in Bath. Regency villas coming up on this brownfield site, providing more homes at greater density than the volume house builders had suggested when the landowner could have turned to them, and at prices affordable to local people. So it can be done. It is easy to dismiss and many have tried, the idea that beauty is appropriate for debate in the political sphere. The argument being that if we are raising the question, the answer is presupposed. This misses something fundamental about the purpose of the work that we've undertaken. Beauty in an objective sense isn't an expressed preference imposed on others, rather it is understood through attention and effort by learning what people need and desire, by what fits and doesn't fit, and what offends and alienates. Through this approach, we come to understand beauty and why it matters to people and to places. By simply having the debate, we've taken a huge step forward, but it's clearly not enough. The question is how do we make what is too often exceptional, too often the preserve of the wealthy, too often a niche pursuit available to everyone. The answer, and if we look at what's behind the creation of so many great places today, is strong community involvement and leadership. To that end, we're making beauty central to the planning system in a way it simply never has been. Through changes to the national planning policy framework and the new national model design code with communities taking the lead. It will be mandatory that every area of the country has a code and every council helps their local neighbourhoods, their parishes, their villages, their local people to create theirs as well. The aim is to establish what is provably popular with local communities and to embed those standards into the planning system via local design codes to ensure consistent, beautiful development. This isn't about prescribing a style or another. It isn't about saying that all new homes must be traditional or indeed modern, but enabling local communities to say what they want and ensuring that they co-design what is built on their doorsteps. It's about taking power out of the hands of the big volume house builders and giving it back to local people. 
with more opportunities for small and medium-sized developers, inspired landowners and local entrepreneurs in a more competitive and diverse industry. And through our longer-term reforms to planning laws, we will stop those local preferences being bulldozed by litigious developers. We will give less airtime for the consultants and the lawyers and more for local people to let us and their local council know what they want and what they don't. By making their preferences the foundations of our planning system, we will enable new homes to be built, but also to be built beautifully. The design code's emphasis on beauty is reinforced by the revised national planning policy framework, which also includes a mandate for all new streets and lanes and avenues to be tree-lined, dramatically improving air quality, biodiversity and access to nature, helping us to get to net zero whilst also building beautifully. The new Homes Ombudsman, which we're legislating for in the Building Safety Bill beginning tomorrow, also champions higher standards that builders must meet. Buyers will now have double the time from six years to 15 years to seek compensation from developers for poor work and shoddy workmanship, with existing homes as well as new builds in scope for the very first time, all of which add up to unprecedented requirements for beauty, for quality and sustainability in better homes, more likely to win public support and therefore more likely to get built. A reset in how we build with communities in control and rules that can no longer be cheated by developers. So we can again value new buildings just as much as those built decades or centuries ago. Now we want to help every local area to seize this opportunity and so today is also an invitation to every council, every parish council, every neighbourhood in the country to come forward to play your part and to shape your own destiny. To that end, the new National Model Design Code provides a toolkit to help those places to develop local design codes of their own that reflect what communities really want. We're channeling this approach in settings ranging from densely populated urban centres to sparse and beautiful rural communities and villages. With pilots being launched today, on top of those involving 14 councils that we announced in May. Our aim is to ensure that councils are ready to step up at a scale so that those design codes and master plans make their mark not just in impressive local estates like the Duchy of Cornwall, but throughout England. This will be a big change. This will mean that if you want to sign off your local plan in the years ahead, you must be able to evidence that you have created these codes and they've not just been created by lawyers and consultants but they've been created by and for local residents. And that's where the, the office for place will be crucial, supporting local people and the industry to create these attractive and popular places. In doing so, it will draw on Britain's world-class expertise in design to help local councils and communities develop user-friendly, easy to understand, digitally accessible and effective design codes for their communities, requiring beauty by default within the planning system to drive up standards. The Office for Place will improve our understanding of people's preferences about places, what makes them popular or not, and how this re relates to public health, to well-being, sustainability and the public good. And by sharing what we learn from our design co-pilots and this research, our aim is shifting an industry culture to a point where mediocrity is no longer proposed or acceptable to the public. I'm delighted that Nicholas Boy smith will lead this organisation. Nicholas is the foremost proponent and one of the most influential champions of this work in Britain today. He and his board of experts many of whom are present here today or listening to this event, and I'm extremely grateful to them, will advise, support, provide a crutch to the arms of neighbourhoods and communities, and will be empowered to highlight where developers are getting things right and where they're getting things wrong, 
and you will have a Secretary of State at your side who will do everything to support you and to use every lever in the planning system to ensure that good happens and bad does not. You'll be hearing very shortly from Nicholas and we'll be able to say more about the board's role and how it will help pilot the design code with communities across England. And so all of this is so obvious, a wisdom that's earned over generations. Then why exactly are we here today? Because good quality design and beauty and community has to be fought for and the case for it has to be made and remade. Sometimes there is a fight to preserve things and sometimes there's a need for things to change. It matters because we feel deeply about our homes and our communities. Few understood this better than Roger Scruton, who we'll miss enormously, especially on days like today. He said, we have a need for friends, for family, for physical contact. We have a need to pass people peacefully on the street, to greet each other and to have a sense of safety in a cared for environment that we know is also ours. The sense of beauty is rooted in these feelings and it is the principal reason why people fight to preserve it. We will fight to preserve it. We will make the case that we need to build more homes as a country to help young people onto the housing ladder, to help those on lower incomes, to enjoy everything that those of us who are homeowners do every day that we open the door to our homes. But we'll also ensure that the legacy we leave as housing ministers, as councils, as communities, is one that we can truly be proud of. It is my great pleasure to introduce Nicholas Boysmith, the chair of the advisory board for the Office for Place, so that Nicholas can say more about what we together will set out to achieve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary of State. Thank you. Can I just have the uh, slides up, please? Um, 18, uh, 18 months ago, uh, a lifetime away, it seems, uh, the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission presented our findings to a, to a packed audience uh, besides uh, Lambeth Palace. There it is. Um, when we begun our labours 12 months previously, under the leadership of, uh, of the late Roger Scruton, some asserted that our task was without purpose and our aims without merit. However... Twelve months on, our proposals were greeted with near universal support. One architect wrote, I'm finding myself agreeing with almost everything, which is a surprise. Uh, the chair of the Academy of Urbanism called it an unexpected joy. From controversy consent, a pluribus unum, perhaps. What had happened, what had happened was that calmly, reasonably, and I, and I hope empirically, we had reviewed the quality, the popularity, the sustainability of the places that we create in England and had found them clearly wanting. Uh, people who wrote in said so. Focus groups around the country said so. Pricing and behavioural analysis said so. And frankly, most of the professionals we spoke to said so. As the pandemic broke a few months later, government and local councils started to take our recommendations on board. Major themes included the need to, the need to re-green our streets and squares, an apple tree for every home, and to rejuvenate our streets' vitality as places to dwell, not just roads to rush through. Um, during the crisis, Robert Jenrick wisely relaxed regulations on street dining and supported the planting of more street trees, following the firm evidence that they are associated with fewer accidents, with greater health, more walking, cleaner air. In January this year, the government followed uh, the Commission's recommendations and published the draft National Model Design Code, published in final form today, a superb document which I commend. Uh, it should guide neighbourhood forums, parish councils, councils and developers to create new places and to steward existing ones to be popular, beautiful, happy and sustainable. Also in January, the government consulted on changes to the National Planning Policy Framework, the overarching document that sets planning policy across the country. It included many of our recommendations to set beauty as an aim of the planning system, to demand enhanced biodiversity from every development and to strengthen council's ability to reject proposals which are ungainly or unsightly. And today we take the next steps, creating the Office for Place, initially within the Ministry of Housing, but in time, I hope, as a newly independent body. I'm, I'm very grateful to the, to the officials who are staffing it, 
to the expert board who are so generously and kindly advising us. One of them is in the room, just checking his pictures there. It is, Paul, I promise you. To the government for asking me to chair the transition board and to the Secretary of State, whose commitment to creating better places, as you've seen today, has been firm and unbending. What is our vision? Ultimately, our vision is to help families, neighbourhoods, parishes, councils, landowners, house builders and developers easily and more seamlessly to create places in which the body can prosper and the soul sing. We invite the British design and development industries to be the best placemakers in the world, aided by improving data on the discoverable links between place with happiness, health, popularity and sustainability. We will do so with five clear principles of being empirical, empowering, flexible, networked and digital. We know from our research that too many of the lives our fellow citizens lead are, in, are, informed, are, are influenced by poor places, no friends around the corner, less sense of community, less walking, less local pride. And you can measure this in shorter lives, in poorer air, in lost trust, in more opposition to house building. Over several generations, the innate, instinctive response of most British people is that new housing will be bad, will be imposed from elsewhere, will be careless of the landscape and the local, of the precious and the particular. It is time to move on from a vicious circle of unpopular development to a virtuous circle of regenerative development. Our job at the Office for Place is to help achieve this. It is to help the British people's instinctive preferences better to be expressed in the places we create and the towns and villages we inhabit so that we can lead happier lives and tread more lightly upon the planet. So what are we going to do? The Office for Place has five areas of focus, which you can see here, and two key tasks in its first year. Firstly, research. We will seek to understand and measure what people value and like. Where do people prosper? Which places are associated with public health? Which are not? We will seek to transform the quality and availability of this research to inform the creation of new places. As the availability of this type of research is transformed, Britain can be and should be at the very forefront of the evolving science of place. Secondly, support. We wish to support the creation and stewardship of more popular places, piloting the creation of local design codes, sharing best practice widely to provide good examples from which to learn. Our working groups are exploring whether and how to write key performance indicators for placemakers, strategic planners, highway officials and others. How to deliver or encourage tools, processes and templates, particularly in less prosperous neighbourhoods. How to monitor, test and accredit quality and co-creation with public KPIs. And what types of place should we be creating? Let me say this unambiguously. We must dare to ask communities what they like and how they wish to live. We need to keep it simple and make use of the exciting possibilities of digital engagement. We should aim to create the conservation areas of the future. For while development can be the cause of ugliness, it can also be the cure. We must combine the best of the old with the new. Fast Wi-Fi, but safe cycling. Beautifully textured streets which look as if they've always been there, overshadowed by the oak trees which really have. 20 years ago, Lord Rogers proposed an urban renaissance. His task force argued that Britain's towns should be better places. His argument was strong. It has led to many important improvements, particularly in cities like London and Manchester, but it was not flawless. Some subsequent development visions have made a naively unnuanced argument that high density development is the future and the answer to all our housing needs. But the broad mass of the British people has rejected this, uh, this purist vision. Like the vast majority of people in all countries, they seek the joys of the garden suburb, the place to call your own. The places which, even when they're communal, are not official. The pub, the back garden, the fireside and the nice cup of tea, as George Orwell fortuitously put it. Even pre-Covid, the most popular form of home in this country, as nearly everywhere, is the private house. People want space. But, to put it lightly, this understandable desire is not without consequences. Sprawling suburbs need a lot more countryside to build upon, um, and that is not always very popular with the people who live there already. Nor in its most elongated variant is it very good for residents. In multiple surveys, sub-suburbs are associated with knowing fewer neighbours and with less active, less healthy lifestyles. Nor are homes which rely upon miles of new roads to get anywhere the affordable, sustainable future to which we aspire. We must find a middle way between the extremes of lumpish blocks crammed into a small urban site on the one hand and low-density sub-suburbs on the other. 
Fortunately, there is an answer that often works. I call it gentle density, a network of beautiful streets and squares, of mansion blocks and terraced and semi-detached houses, anchored around real middles, a village green or a local corner shop, tree-lined avenues, streets that children can safely walk along, beautiful houses that cherish and evolve the local vernacular, um, and, uh, and nestle thoughtfully in the landscape. Blocks with clear backs and fronts, which are associated with lower crime and better use of little and often green spaces. Such places tend to be more popular and more prosperous. No one ever complained that a town had too many squares. People respond more ornately and organically to streets which have coherent complexity, colour, texture, and whose forms and features invite you to walk or mimic, however imperceptibly, some of the patterns of nature. Gentle density, expansion and intensification is also part of the answer to levelling up, fixing the scars in too many of our towns. The digital revolution can make the towns left behind by post-industrialisation viable economic centres once again, making use of existing infrastructure, not just pouring houses into a field. Now, some inspired landowners, developers and community groups are already delivering this model. The Prince of Wales is the best known, but he is far from alone. Uh, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation at Dewanthorpe, the Bourne Estate in London, which we visited on Friday, uh, Lux and Albans, the Homebake CLT, Marmalade Lane in Cambridge, uh, and I could name many others. And I, I think the, the residents of Marmalade Lane probably made the case that I'm trying to make rather better probably than I am. But all are playing their part. Often such places are created with profound levels of neighbourly involvement or even community leadership, and this is no coincidence. Done well, greater planning certainty through visual design codes, as the office place will be supporting, will rebalance the scale in favour of the gentle infill, the self-build, the custom build, the SME, the homeowner, and the I'll say it again, the innovative entrepreneur. Now, the places of the future will, will not be the same as the places of the past, but they will rhyme. We can do some things far more cheaply now, the exciting possibilities of modular building, but other things are harder. What was two a penny a hundred years ago, a, a delicate string course or some gently patterned bricks, is now the preserve of the wealthy. That's something to fix. Places of the future should more confidently integrate trees and plants into the town than used to be the case. Uh, preserving hedgerows or green corridors running through new settlements, creating allotments. Again, provably popular and good for us. The natural kingdom has a place in the urban realm. Now, the good news is that the types of place that people find homely, safe and beautiful are, all the polls and pricing data tell us, fairly consistent by age and sex, wealth and race, religion and politics. The type of place we live in knowing your neighbour, feeling at home in the world, knowing that your children can move safely around the neighbourhoods are not partisan passions. We can all agree on this. Fast roads, bad air, over-large buildings, featureless facades are not the settled preference of the British people, which is why you rarely see them in the most expensive neighbourhoods. Creating beautiful places is also to build sustainably. Ugly buildings rarely outlive their primary use, but beautiful buildings transcend their first transitory purpose and sail on into the future. The Edwardian power plant turned into a cafe, the medieval barn such as this turned into an art gallery, the ground floor of a terraced home turned into a shop and then perhaps an office and now a home again. Resilient and successful places flex their uses easily over the centuries and in doing so their, their whole life carbon cost collapses. Constructing a new built home uses roughly the equivalent uh, of, of 80 tonnes of CO2. Refurbishment uses about eight. Even with the highest energy efficient specification, the new build would take 100 years to catch up. Now, and I promise I'm, not, I'm on the homeward stretch now, we, we, did, we did not used to be afraid of the concept of beauty. The great Octavia Hill wrote that we all want beauty for the refreshment of our souls, and she sought to provide it in the homes that she created for working people. We now need to reinvigorate the living tradition of placemaking. Now, that does not necessarily mean creating a house which looks as if it was built in 1820, they do if you wish, but it does mean understanding the qualities of street, of building, of height and of facade which make places popular and homely. We all need our home, our place, as we make our way through the world. Britain is creating some of the best places in the world, but it's too rare. We must do so far more often for the betterment of our neighbours, the advancement of our industry, and for the delicacy with which we tread upon the planet. I am delighted to be chairing a new office for place, and particularly on a hot day like this, I'm rolling up my sleeves. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.
see uh, quite a lot of uh, questions. If I just uh, still nonetheless encourage everyone to, uh, as many people to put their hands up so we get as wide a variety of uh, opinion here as possible. I see first question come up from uh, Bruce Buckland, distinguished architect, Bruce, question. Hi there, Dean. Can you hear me? I hope you can hear me well. Yeah, loud Sorry, and clear. my camera off. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the involvement of architects uh, in this process, because it struck me that um, while your design codes are a very good addition to um, the progress that you're making and to the policies you're rolling out, I don't know whether that you're intending them to apply to both permitted development rights and also to the very large developments, which tend not to have architects involved. So two parts, will your, will your policy apply to permitted development rights? And secondly, where you have large developments, very, very large developments, often suburban ones done by large developers, what will you do to make sure architects are involved in those developments rather than them being done purely in house and ending up like toy town kind of developments? Thank you. Was your question directed at any one panelist or you wanted to hear the totality of their uh, opinions? Uh, probably to Nick. Okay, thank, th thank you very much, uh, Bruce. I, mean, I think there are two levels of answer, really. The first is, is perhaps to make a historical analogy, uh, arguably the most important architect of the 18th century were the people who uh, influenced some of the London Housing and Building Acts. So I think there's an enormous role for architects working uh, with councils, with neighbored forums, with parish councils, uh, to help set design codes. I think that's an existential uh, important role for architects. And I thoroughly agree with your point that you know, too many of the places that are created have no architecture involvement at all. It's absolutely disastrous. So I think at a strategic level, there's that. Um, and then I think in, uh, I should also mention that on the, uh, on the transition board, uh, we've got at least two architects and many others who are very architecturally uh, aware. And then I think there's a, I think it's probably a specific point which I'll turn over to Joanna, just in terms of the role of architects with permitted development. Thanks very much, Nicholas. Uh, just to come in on uh, the role of the National Model Design Code as it relates to any development that's coming through the planning system, there are some very important points of policy and guidance that are captured both within the uh, MPPF and the National Model Design Code, and it's this. The National Model Design Code is there. It's in the current planning system. All development uh, can use it as a guide, uh, both if you're the developer, the community, or the local planning authority. And in the absence of a, an existing design code or design guidance, then the National Model Design Code is there for reference. So when you look at this at, at schemes, if you're promoting schemes, uh, I would encourage uh, people to sort of consider that local authorities might be using the National Model Design Code as a reference in decision making. So it's really important that all those promoting development at any scale use it as their starting point. Use it as their starting point for engagement with communities, use it as their starting point for setting out the broadest parameters for any development of any scale uh, and then use that to, to bring forward development that, that meets all the objectives that we've heard about this morning. Did you want to say something? Um, well, just to build on Joanna's point, absolutely. The, the design code is there as the default position. Of course, we don't believe you can have a single national code for the whole country. We live in you know, such a wonderfully diverse and varied country, but it is there and we expect every developer now to be paying heed to it and local councils, when they're reviewing applications, to be probing and prodding, does this really meet the expectations that are set out in this code? And then obviously we want councils and communities to go off and create their own versions of this, using this as a starting point, but thinking carefully, using all of the research that Nicholas has already done in his career through Create Streets and will do through the Office for Place, to understand what's really locally popular in a place, designing, creating your own code, and and to reach a point where local communities and members of planning committees, or whoever it might be, feel empowered to say no to bad development on the grounds that it, it, is, it is ugly. It, you know, it, it, it does not enhance the built environment of a particular place. And that happens quite rarely. <laughs> that's the change that we're looking for. Thank you. Elizabeth Hopkirk, Building Design. Elizabeth Thanks. Hopkirk, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Um, my question is, um, the communities are, um, these are fine words, but communities in reality are very unlikely to have um, spare time to help um, shape a local design code. 
Uh, so who's actually going to do this work in reality? It's surely going to be vested interests, um, developers, people with people with money, who, who kind of make it look through token engagement like communities are uh, are involved. How will you uh, prevent that happening? Who wants to come in, Joanne? We're really delighted to already be working with 14 local authorities across England and today, as the Secretary of State announced, we're, we, we, we're inviting others to come forward with an expression of interest. So Elizabeth, to your point, we're very conscious that this is asking people to think more broadly about design and beauty uh, and that we will be, we're basically working with people to sort of see what works best for them, how they can really own the National Model Design Code. It is a toolkit. It's there as a very, very useful set of uh, guidance and parameters and there's a process outlined in there so we're sort of trying to make it very easy and, and one of our key objectives in terms of the pilots are to have really great templates that others can kind of say okay I, I can see how Hertf um, Herefordshire for example or Southwark who are two of the existing codes are dealing with these issues in their locality what can I learn from what others are doing so we're not just doing pilots for those local authorities and with those communities but also then using that to get out messages, learning um, and experience to many local authorities and communities across the country. Nicholas. Thank you. If I can uh, just add one thing to Joanna's excellent comments. Uh, hello, hello, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, this is a really exciting moment, actually, for community engagement. Um, I think the, the criticism that community engagement has been too, too inclined to be the people who will turn up on a wet Tuesday evening, I think has had validity to it. Um, suddenly, well, suddenly, over the last few years, that is dramatically ceasing to be the case. Uh, actually, you know, the experience of the last 16 months, uh, the potential for digital engagement, the different ways of interacting with people, of allowing engagement to be both deep, those who want to get very firmly involved, but also broader, and bringing in perhaps more fleetingly a much wider group of people uh, is, is just exploding. There's lots of organisations, firms, community groups, charities out there doing it. So I think, it, you know, I think now is the time to be, to be, uh, to be, to be, tr to be trialling this. Robert. Well, I'd only add that the, the current planning system is very poor at engaging with the public. Uh, there's no criticism of the people who work within it. It's just that the evidence shows that. One percent of the public get involved in their local plan making process. The statistics vary, but it's only three or four percent of people who get involved in other respects, such as commenting on, on applications. So we have a system which doesn't engage the public today to anything like the extent that it should do. How are we going to change that? Well, we've got a number of ideas. This is one of them. Let's get people involved in actually deciding what they want the building to look like in their area. And Nicholas's organisation will help to make that happen. So it's not just Southwark Council leading this with their consultants and uh, architects and so on, although they will play a very important role, but it's really the local community as well. We also see huge potential in digitalisation. The current planning system is one of the last great form-based 20th century systems. We need to modernise it and if we can digitise it then we as lay people can be looking at our smartphone, a truly map-based approach, understanding what the rules are, what are the designations in my area, where are the applications coming through, what does the design code look like. I think that can be revolutionary and it can mean that it's not just that small very engaged group of the public who are really involved in making decisions in the planning system, but it's a much broader group of people as well who are going about their busy daily lives but will engage um, in that way. And then the last point is the planning reforms that we're bringing forward are trying to make the planning system much simpler and more comprehensible to everybody. The, the people who benefit at the moment from the planning system are obviously the, the groups that uh, advise and consult. They're the big volume house builders who've got the resources to navigate its complexities and can hire the QCs and consultants. The people who lose out are small and medium sized builders, members of the public, and in fact many local councils because our councillors are trying to do a good job but understandably I get frustrated that it takes seven years to produce a local plan or that development management policies might run to hundreds or thousands of pages. Which of my excellent local councils truly have the time to understand and engage with that? And we shouldn't be expecting them to. So we want to end up with a planning system which has better outcomes than the current one, better public engagement, but in a simpler and more comprehensible way. Thank you. So John Hayes, MP, who's, taken, who's had the longest part to play in this debate with man who takes a Tory view of landscape. Uh, I know, and, uh, and played a major part in, uh, in, in 
beauty as in, in your period at Department of Transport. Uh, thank you so much. Christine. Can everybody a hear? Word of, a word of thanks, a word of warning, and a word of my own. A word of thanks <laughs> is to, to Robert, really, because uh, your leadership of this has been so important, Robert. And for a politician to take this stand is actually, it doesn't sound as bold as it is, but it is extremely bold. And great beauty is something really important. I know it's rooted in your consciousness. Uh, it has been from uh, And then Nicholas for his leadership, so thank you. A word of warning, you're right, Robert, about how far we have to travel. Many local authorities aren't even off the starting block on this. And it's partly because they don't have the wherewithal to challenge some of the orthodoxy and particularly to challenge some of the power of the big developers. So I just warn that this is a difficult road we'll need to travel, and being bold in involving those local authorities is critical. And I said there was a third word of my own. One of my own is that we do need to look beyond housing too. As I look at the most monstrous developments now, they're off an edge of out-of-town retail developments, or huge warehouses uh, being built on, often on refilled sites actually, up and down our major road networks. And so looking at place means looking beyond housing to all that constitutes place. And I'd be interested in your thoughts on whether that's something we should look at fairly urgently, given what you said about your determination to take further steps on guidance and so on. Thank you. Well, John, thank you for everything that, that, that you've done. Uh, at DFT, you made the case for beautiful bridges over our roads and railways um, and I hope you'll get your wish and have the Euston Arch <laughs> reinstated one day. Uh, I'll certainly support you anyway I can on that, on that front. Uh, I, you're, you're right that this is a bit of a David and Goliath battle because we need to be enabling local communities and councils to have the wherewithal to stand up to significant vested interests and to big volume house builders, some of whom are moving in the right direction but quite slowly and we need to help to, to tip the scales in the balance of the, uh, the councils and communities. That, there's a number of different sides of that. I hope that uh, Joanna and Nicholas will help from a department and offers for place perspective. I'm very aware that local councils planning departments are hard pressed. Often very small numbers of individuals trying to do all sorts of different things and we're alive to that and thinking through how we can get them more resources because this will be a big task for them if we're going to really make this happen across the country. The fundamental point I think you raise is that we as a government recognise the importance of quality and a design and a beauty in a way that I think not every government in the past has done so. And I believe that you don't have to pick a side between supply and quality and design. And that is different, I think, to much of the debate that you hear today. Most people tend to take the view you can either be building more homes, in which case, yes, you're on the side of young people, you're on the side of low-income families, but you're a bit of a vandal because you don't care about the countryside or our towns and communities. Or you're somebody who cares passionately about all those things, but you're turning a blind eye to the social consequences of not building enough homes. I think there must be a harmony between those two positions. We must be able to find a way as a grown-up, mature country to make a case for building more homes, for meeting the needs of our society, but also doing so in a way which is sustainable and beautiful and to a standard that we would look to leave to our children and grandchildren. That's what we're setting out to achieve. Can I just ask you one thing in this connection, just while we're on the politics of it, as it were, is the chances of building a consensus on this subject, because of course it's a, it's a matter which uh, we've held uh, panel events on with, on beauty and the left, Lisa Nandy, John Cruddus, Morris Glassman, others have appeared, John McDonald, great fan of William Morris. I'm just wondering, because it's something which cut, cuts across divides and uh, Sir John, for one, has been critical of uh, you know, a certain type of developer just in the past amongst the other Tory MPs, just interested in your thoughts of what could happen here out of sort of this great apparently controversial clash as I think Nicholas Boy Smith said earlier, you know, some kind of new unity can come. Well, well I certainly hope so. Uh, you're right to say that 
This runs deep through the traditions of conservatism and through other uh, political parties as well, going back to uh, the, the, the history of the, the Labour Party. And Bevan was one of the first uh, to say that we should be building more social houses, but they should be of the same quality and design as those that you could buy in the, uh, the, the private market as well. So there's all sorts of people one could turn to. I think the debate does need to mature because at the moment people tend to take very sectional approaches. So there are people who care only about the supply of new homes. There are people who only care about the environmental impact of new homes, who only care about design. Well, as Secretary of State, I have to, we have, someone has to hold the ring and say, what is in the national interest? How do those things come together in a degree of harmony? And as I say, my position is we have to be setting out to build more homes, but also to do so in a careful and considered way that's sustainable. And I hope that other people can come on board with that approach and be willing to put aside some concerns at the edges to see that there is a national consensus to be found at the centre. Okay, else Bridget uh, Rosewell, distinguished economist, expert on medieval bridges, distinguished Wolfson Prize here at Policy Exchange. Bridget, can you hear us? Can we hear you? Bridget, are you there? I'll come back to you in a second or two. I think we've got a question at the front from... Oh, very good. Thank you. Christopher Hope, I see, has been waiting patiently for a while. Christopher Hope from The Telegraph, are you there? You there? We can't hear you. We'll come back to you. Somebody else asking a question. Name an organisation, please. We'll give you a microphone. Okay. Hello, I'm here. I'm here. Hello. One second, Christopher. We just, uh, I'll give you the next question. Someone else has just come in. Thank you, Dean. Hello, it's Victoria Hills Royal Town Planning Institute, and it's a question for Joanna. Uh, Joanna, in your role as Chief Planner, refle reflecting on design policy over Hello. the last 20 years or so, um, how big a moment is this for improving design policy in planning? Um, thanks, Victoria. I think it's an astonishingly important moment. I mean, having worked across regeneration housing schemes, uh, working for actually in different political climates, actually, uh, it's, it really strikes me about this being a moment of, of real pivot towards us as a total industry, getting behind quality, beauty and placemaking. And uh, we've all been very reflective, as Nicholas was saying, on what our homes, what our neighbourhoods mean to us. And this is the moment where there has to be a kind of whole industry response. Um, and I, I, I can't think of uh, really a time when we've got the alignment of the national planning policy framework saying that approve good things and turn down the bad. We've got a uh, national model design code which very, very ably outlines all different aspects of the built and the natural environment in, in urban uh, and, and town and rural um, settings. Uh, and, and outlines a menu of those things that are important to all of us and have been important to us for a very long time uh, and gives that weight in the current planning system. So we've combined a lot of years of, of campaigning and knowledge from people in this room and from Nicholas and from the Secretary of State to have a moment of, of real change. Um, and I, I, just, I just think it's uh, incredibly exciting. And we're sort of looking forward to working with local authorities and communities across the country to sort of see, see that realized. Um, but I think it'll take everybody. It'll take the developer, the community, the local planning authority to, to realize this p point of change um, and to sort of see us delivering better things more consistently, as Nicholas very ably said. Thank you. Uh, Christopher Hope, can you hear us now and can you come in on time? Can you hear us? It may be a second or two longer. I'll defer you one. Can you hear, can you hear me now, Dean? Yes, we can hear you now, loud and clear. Your question. I, I'm, I'm sorry I can't be that. I'm, I'm self-isolated like half the country. Sorry, Minister and everybody else. A, a, a quick question for the Secretary of State. Uh, Robert Jenrick, do you think that, well, your own MPs plus communities have a moral duty to allow more building near them? You mentioned the idea of a national effort, a national interest. Do you think there is a moral duty on people not to fight new development? Well, I think we do have a duty to the next generation and to those on lower incomes to build more homes and ensure that families 
can live and grow up with the security and the pride that comes with a secure housing. That's something that is rooted in the traditions of all political parties. It was the first item of Clement Attlee's 1945 manifesto, and one that had been a core tenant of the Conservative Party um, since at least the 1950s as well. But what we're saying today is that we also expect that local people and councils can demand that those homes are built to a very high standard and that they are in keeping with the character and the heritage of local communities, that they have ready access to outdoor space and good public services and that they're greener and more sustainable than homes today. So there is also a moral duty on developers to listen to the needs and legitimate desires of local communities and to bring forward higher quality developments than we've seen in recent decades. That's the reset that we're seeking here, more and better homes. Thank you. Uh, Peter John of Southwark Council, former leader of the council. Peter, always welcome here. Can you hear us? Peter, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? It was... Can you hear me, Dean? Loud and clear. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, it was just picking up a bit on uh, what Robert was talking about in his comments, because they seem to be based around using this design to secure good estate regeneration. Um, I mean, in Southwark, we've got a history of estate regeneration with the Haygate, Aylesbury, Ledbury estates, and some very good design. And um, uh, I know you mentioned Southwark earlier on. I was also noting, Robert, um, uh, your references to both uh, Nye Bevan and Clem Attlee, that things, we're living in a topsy-turvy world. But I, I just wanted to press you on estate regeneration because, uh, you know, in order to make estate regenerations viable, you have to go for height sometimes. And I don't know whether height is consistent with what you've been talking about today. You know, do, do you prefer kind of denser blocks or, or taller blocks? Is there a preference that um, the panellists would, would um, prefer to, to see in the state regeneration in order to make it viable? Do you want to go and then, well, all three of you? Yes, Nick no. First. Um, my Crate Street's journey, uh, Peter, actually started in Southwark because I drove past the Aylesbury estate to buy pot plants at B&Q about 10 years ago and started to look at what you were planning there. Uh, strange but true. Um, I think that there's, no, there's no one answer that's always right. Um, I think it's fair to say that high-rise and very big buildings do come with resilience challenges, and all the data, I think, shows tend to be harder to make work um, other than in city centres and for very wealthy people. They're just, they cost more to run. Uh, they do come with well-being disadvantages, particularly for children and particularly for less prosperous. That's not a never. It's not a no in principle in all circumstances. But I think you know, very high density, super density, particularly the high-rise variant, is something to be used with caution. And so I think in an estate regeneration context, you know, where you are uh, perforce, uh, rightly, just for the record, going to be rehousing people who lived on the estate before, as you should, um, you know, it's, it's to be approached thoughtfully. Um, that, but uh, the, the, the best way to get density, we tend to find in the evidence, is through a, you know, a gentle matrix of, of mansion blocks, of terraced homes, of tightly, finely grained streets and private spaces. Lots of things, parking, uh, overhanging distances, back to front distances, have made that hard to do in the last couple of generations, as I'm sure you don't need me to say. Um, I think one of the points of the Office for Place and for the evolving planning situation is to allow us to do that type of traditional cityscape and townscape a bit more frequently than we have in the last generation. Joanne. Thanks. Just coming on this, we, we all know that estate regeneration is, is complex. It has to be done with great care. Um, and I think one of the things I've always seen in looking at estate regeneration schemes is the, is the attention to... Uh, the quality of the public realm, the quality of the private space, whether that's a balcony, um, and the quality of play. I know it sounds a, a very specific point, but when, uh, as you say, the economics mean that you do have to increase density, then working, getting the public realm to work exceptionally hard and for it to be about how people move around, not how vehicles move around, and how you have fine doorstep play 
and how you define the private and the public and how you bring green uh, into uh, estate regeneration. That can sometimes be about roofscape as well as streetscape. You just have to work that much harder, be that much more careful and also bring character into how you design for estate renewal. There is an existing community uh, uh, that must be you know, listened to, as Nicholas is saying, heard, and how you can reflect that, that character within architecture is actually quite interesting. That an entrance isn't just a doorway, but it's actually it's a front door for people, for many families that might be living in an individual block, bringing in colour, bringing in artwork. All these things have to just be done. So it's the care and that detail of attention which really has to be followed through on the state regeneration, particularly where you're increasing densities. Doesn't mean say hi, but it's more people living in the same space. Uh, well, just on the point on tall buildings, I mean, I've always taken the view that it's not for the government to tell people whether or not to build tall buildings or not. Uh, they will be suitable in some locations, but most definitely not in others. And I used my powers to direct the Mayor of London that the London plan should enable every local authority to come up with their own tall buildings policy so that your former borough um, or indeed any other one in London, could say where they do want tall buildings and where they don't. And there will be some places in London, for example, where it's perfectly logical to build tall buildings uh, because there are already existing clusters of tall buildings, like on the Isle of Dogs or Nine Elms, and we can debate whether or not all of those are the most architecturally beautiful clusters of tall buildings, but they are there today and it's not illogical to add to them. But you could also decide that it, does, it is not right in the suburbs of London to go and build incongruous tall buildings next to 1930s semi-detached homes. And I have a lot of sympathy for residents who feel that that is uh, damaging the, the look and feel of their communities. So we've really given local authorities the power to listen to their communities and come up with sensible tall building policies. I am concerned in some places about tall buildings ruining the look and feel of particular communities. I used my powers as Secretary of State, for example, to turn down an application to build a tall building in Norwich near to the historic cathedral there because I didn't feel that was of high quality and would have damaged the historic setting of the cathedral. So I think developers need to listen to the views of local communities and to come to a sensible view as to whether these are really appropriate in different settings. Thank you. If I just take final questions, a brace of questions, as it were. Lady there wants to ask a question. And uh, then Will Hurst from the Architects Journal. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Esther Curland and I'm a member of the office. I will take this off to talk. Sorry, um, we, if you could repeat it again. Sorry, uh, if I could. Esther Curland, I'm a member of the Office of Place Transitional Board. It's been really encouraging today to hear everything that's said and particularly the positive role for architects and the support that's hopefully coming for local planning authorities to be able to deliver uh, what we've heard about. But um, I think that, it, like your advice on how we can all support a culture change in the planning world, because we're not just talking about architects and planners um, and communities, but um, planning lawyers, development, economic people, regeneration people, household, what can we all practically do to help the community, the planning community, move forward in the way you've described as a reset. And Will Hurst, Architects Journal. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I suppose it's mainly a question um, for the Secretary of State. Um, it's great to see all the um, focus uh, in this announcement on environmental sustainability, greener homes have been mentioned a lot, net zero. Um, but I think it's well accepted now in the construction of property industries that the greenest building is the one that already exists. And obviously Nicholas touched on that in his presentation. Um, it's talked about in our retroverse campaign, as you may know. And it was picked up in the final report of the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission. So I wondered what is being done really to make sure that circular economy principles and reuse of existing buildings happens as much as it can do uh, as these planning proposals go forward. Thank you. Joanna first, then Nicholas, and then if you could just answer the, the omnibus, then 
Thank, thanks. Uh, just return to Esther's question on, on how we, we, we take everybody and I, with us on this journey. I think it's really important because what we, we do in, these, in, in this country so well is we have a multidisciplinary approach to placemaking and we bring the best of architecture, urban design, planning, landscape architecture, engineering, uh, property economics uh, and so on. Engineer, it, 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 all of those parties have to, pl have to sort of come together to make a successful place. Planting a tree needs a lot of expertise. Um, uh, in a street. It's not always as simple as it might first appear. So I do think, I would really just commend the National Model Design Code to people. It's just such a good menu of the issues that we should be collaborating on, should be getting together on, should be trying to deliver on the ground. Uh, start the conversation. If you don't know enough about some of the technical issues, there are many organisations out there who might decide to say, actually, we'll do a deep dive on street trees and not just the planting of, but the maintenance of street trees. Uh, we'll do a deep dive on how you do character, character area analysis to understand the starting position for our built environment, for changing our built environment. And that, to some extent, talks to Will's point, which is we should always value what we have already, understand its quality, its character, its adaptability, its flexibility. And that goes for, for walls and roofs and buildings, but it also goes for landscapes. We're at this, the MPPF is really important, not just in terms of the built fabric, but the natural fabric that we want to bring into urban areas. We want to sustain, but we also want to enhance. So there's a very strong theme within the National Model Design Code and the MPPF around nature, ecology, and landscape. So I just commend that to people. Uh, and over to Nicholas. Thank you, Joanna, and thank you, Esther. I'm, I'm tempted to say in, in uh, answer to Esther's question, oh, well, we'd we'll be talking about this. Um, I remember the first workshop I, the first co-design workshop I ever ran, uh, where one of the professionals, nice man, uh, who was there, about halfway through came up to me and said, you actually really did want people here, didn't you? Um, so surprised that the whole thing wasn't essentially a semi-fake, where we were running it to sort of you know, manage a process to get the outcome we wanted. And he was genuinely surprised. Um, so, you know, without any way of wishing to be rude about the industry and you know hugely skilled and, and well-intentioned and good people I'm afraid in too many situations we have got ourselves into a cynical vicious cycle of expect everyone to hate it and just sort of work our way through it and do what we need to do to get through the hoops and I think anyone who works in the industry will recognize that there is truth in that it's not said in an, an aggressive way um, so we do need to reset um, there is no easy answer I think Although hopefully we can make progress in the next 12 months, I think ultimately this is a generational change, maybe even a super generational change. T two things that I think that have struck out to me that perhaps we haven't touched on so far, and which are amongst the working groups that we have set up. One, I think, and actually, Esther, this is a point you've made, is, is actually sharing best practice. Um, what, what I found is incredibly uh, powerful is to take people to a place or to get them talking to a group who've done something in a certain way and not have me or Joanna telling them what to do with the best respect, sorry, but, you know, but actually allow them to have a conversation with someone who's been down a similar route before. So that, that's a nice. I guess there maybe there's a, there's a tougher one, which is, is there a, a role, and I'm, I'm speculating here, is there a role for changing some of the targets or incentives for people working in the industry? I, I, I won't be specific as to where, but I was very struck in a conversation I was having a couple of weeks ago uh, with a very senior and well-intentioned, good official um, who just wasn't seeing that the rather fast dual carriageway slicing through the middle of the town where he was working was really having quite a negative effect on all sorts of people in all sorts of ways. And now, if he had a metric, you know, for air quality or for connectivity across the city in his sort of, you know, monthly or annual targets, would that change his behaviour? Question mark. I'll, I'll leave it there. Just quickly on, uh, on, on Will's question, um, you know, where we build is incredibly important, and I was talking about gentle density, uh, and, and John, uh, John's question touched on this as well, but where we build and where we expect development to happen is incredibly important. And I think if we are able to evolve a model in the years to come, where we do more of our development as intensification, organically and naturally, in existing towns and suburbs and cities, not because it's being imposed from on high, but because it's something we allow more organically to come bottom up from a wider range of organisations, I think ultimately that is the fundamentally profound way, Will, to answer your, I think, very, very powerful and important challenge, which is how can we get more out of existing towns and places um, at a slightly higher density than the sort of 20 homes or so per hectare that we've typically built in the last generation. And I think that's the, that's the big picture answer, I think. That's, uh, that's all I'd add. Thank you. Secretary of State. Yes, well, on the, the last question, I, I totally agree with what Nicholas said. 
I think as we're coming out of the pandemic, we don't yet know exactly how profound the changes will be in our town centres and city centres and the way we live and work. But it is clear there's going to be significant opportunities for building more homes and creating new and different places. And we've got to seize those. That's why we've set out as a government in the last year to create a very flexible environment in which you can turn a cafe into a solicitor's office, into a yoga studio. If that is sat there empty and derelict, you can turn it into a home. That is so that we can deliver those homes, we can recycle those existing buildings, give them a new lease of life, and so that we don't have to live in a country where there are empty shops and uh, things that are so um, emblematic of decay and decline. Uh, we want to change that, we want to breathe new life into those places. It's one of the reasons why we've taken such steps forward in terms of converting offices into homes. Now, we've got to make sure that we do that to a high standard and that we root out the sort of rabbit hutch homes and uh, the ones that have given it a poor name in recent years. But those changes are exactly what we need to do if we're going to avoid building on the countryside. We can protect those parts of the country that we all care about and ensure that our towns and cities have got more vitality more mixed use in the years ahead and to the very good point about how do you embed this within the system well every significant attempt to change the planning system has taken many decades to succeed I mean it's about 30 years since my predecessor George Young uh, started the truly plan based system and as I stand here today about 50% of the country either doesn't have a plan at all or doesn't have one that's up to date and so if we want to drive this change and drive the broader changes that we've also spoken about, like digitization, for example, we're going to have to have the whole sector or sectors working together in a real generational change to make sure that succeeds. And of course, planning reforms are always contentious, but I think there are some things we do all agree on. And design is one that should be a great uniter. I think the digitization agenda should be a great force of unity and there are others as well and we now need to work together to achieve that in common purpose in the years ahead. Thank you. Just winding up, just wanted to say thank you to Secretary of State and for his colleagues for choosing policy exchange. It's picked a pleasure for policy exchange to see this debate evolve. I remember when we started our work with the, the late Sir Roger Scruton, there were many people all across the spectrum who were saying that it was an irrelevant frippery, the subject of beauty, and thanks to your work, that of your colleagues, it's now where it should be, at the centre of the national conversation. I just want to pay tribute to those at Policy Exchange who've uh, wor worked on it through time. Liam Booth-Smith, Jack Airy, Ben Southwood, Samuel Hughes, who produced our new uh, building beautiful newsletter today, which uh, should have gone out to all of you, certainly. I hope we're bombarding you uh, with it, but uh, <laughs> it's a uh, it's really vital topic. We have four themes here at Policy Exchange, prosperity, patriotism, people, place, and uh, it's wonderful to see that echoed in the new office for place uh, being set up, uh, not just about housing, as many here have always pointed out, it's about the totality of the built environment and many other issues besides, but uh, and touch as many issues as Secretary of State said, having to look at it in the round, you know, not just one single dimension, but the quantity, quality of the audience today, as I said earlier, is indicative just quite how important this is. We never had to work less hard to get a really big, high quality audience here, and that's a sign of the interest and the curiosity which is peaked by this vital subject. And pay tribute again to all of you for playing your part in shooting it up the national agenda. Thank you.